ready, setting, let's do it. What is up, everyone? And welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. As always, I'm Tony, here with Mariana, and it's no secret, this fitness industry, the one we're in right now, it's not the best. It sucks, right? Whether it's the corrupt multi-billion dollar supplement and weight loss industry, some of which we're going to talk about today, or the endless supply of influencers promoting absolutely anything to drive page views. The bottom line is we're not just trying to provide another fitness podcast, but actually change the fitness industry for the better. It all starts with you, right? Why can't we start making the change? But we want to do this by providing you with the knowledge and tools to give you the confidence in applying the best possible training, nutrition, and supplementation into your own life, where today we are going to be covering part one of a two-part segment of the top 10 scams in the fitness, health, and supplement industry. We've talked about certain myths before, but a scam is defined as simply a dishonest scheme or fraud. A fraud being wrongful or deceitful with intent to result in financial or personal gain. This industry might be more fraudulent than non-fraudulent. After reading that, I'm like, that kind of explains the whole thing almost. Yeah. But we went ahead and ranked our top 10 to break down the science of not only why there are scams, why they don't work, but actually to give you solutions on how things actually work. And before we jump in, if you haven't already, take the time, as Mariana tells you about some cool stuff going on, to rate this show five stars. It takes a minute and you can give us a follow. It gives us a little dopamine rush, new followers, like that, <laughs> on Spotify, but that way it actually reminds you every time we post an episode every single Monday, it'll pop up and remind you so you don't miss a thing. Also, we love the questions that you guys DM us after each episode comes out. Tony and I also get personal DMs on each of our end, and we really want to dedicate time to those because a lot of the time the questions require a much more detailed and thorough answer than could be answered on social media because your health is not simple. So you can join us on the premium side for just $5 a month where you get a bonus episode every single Friday where we do an Ask Me Anything style episode responding to your specific questions. Recently, we did an episode on deload weeks, continuous glucose monitors. And we also just got a question on exercise before pregnancy, during pregnancy. So we cover everything under the sun and that really gives yeah. us more of a chance to interact with you and get more specific and answer these nuances. So just by being a Fitness Stuff Premium member, you're also entered in our $300 Legion Supplement giveaway every single month. So you can sign up in the show notes below. And it's mm. just $5 a month. And we just gave away that first 300 ah, this oh, last we did. Week. Yes. Yeah. And quick note from our sponsor, Legion Athletics. You guys know how we feel about them by now. Something really exciting is yeah. they just launched three new protein powder flavors, apple pie, banana bread, and blueberry muffin, which I think oh. I'm the most excited about. I'm going to be making so many recipes with these. And I haven't tried any yet. Banana bread, bro? At work? I'm really excited. Those are pretty unique. You don't find those, I feel like, in a lot of- No. Dude, I'm I've, pumped. I'm, are I'm you really pumped most about the blueberry? I'm so yes. pumped about blueberry muffins. Yeah. Even though the banana really bit, bread video. Do you remember that viral video? Banana bread at work, bro? I don't remember it. <laughs> this just goes to show, if you wait, good things come. Like you never, Okay, I'm going to send you that afterwards. But I'm pumped for blueberries. I think Okay, you can get creative with those recipes too. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. feel like that flavor so is going to be cake. And so if you want to try it, you can use the link in our show notes or type in the code FSPOD at checkout for 20% off your first order or double points on every order after that. And if you can't tell, because I think we've already brought it up at least twice in this intro, if there's one thing we don't shut up about, it's protein, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? What we just talked about. But that's really just because whatever your goal is, whether you're trying to lose fat, get cut and lean out for the summertime or build muscle, get buff and get strong, or even if you just really want to live a higher quality, longer life, protein's usually at the center of your nutritional needs. And we definitely get asked a lot, which type of protein should I choose? There's a lot of them and everyone has their own personal preferences about taste or quantity, but we're partnering with The Strong Inside, which is an educational resource, not trying to sell you anything, but to help you learn more about proteins from milk, specifically whey protein. We just ended our great giveaway with them oh. by now. So you'll be hearing about the winner this month. If you didn't know, whey protein is a protein derived from milk and tested as the highest quality form of protein, which is one of the reasons why we're so obsessed with it. It's because it's complete protein, meaning it contains all nine essential amino acids and it's absorbed more quickly than other types of protein. It's found not just in your basic whey protein powder, but also added to protein bars and shakes. Look for whey, whey protein concentrate or whey protein isolate on labels, all which deliver a high protein content. 
Yeah. And today, finally, more people are looking at the science to take a more evidence-based approach at finding their best protein. And the Strong Inside is really just on a mission to educate them about the complete proteins that come from milk. Because I think that's the funniest thing is people have that weird barrier where they don't understand that whey protein is one of the highest Mm. quality sources of protein you can give yourself. And once you figure out that it's kind of important, you want to figure out, well, how much do I need? And that's really a highly individual question. That's what we talk about pretty much on the show is there's no one size fits all answer. And the strong inside has a cool protein calculator down that we're going to put in our show notes or on the strong inside.com that you can utilize to really find out based on your unique body weight, fitness level goal or life stage, how much protein you should be aiming for yeah they just helped us give away a freaking peloton treadmill peloton. <laughs> the treadmill of awesome. freaking treadmills going on not a scam let's talk about some scams oh my that's gosh going i'm into. so excited Dude, okay i don't know if i caught you up on this because i did a, one of my videos i did a shorter video which kind of came up with this idea where i just kind of rattled off as many scams as i could think of in the fitness industry and it went semi what do you consider viral well is this your earlier one or did you do one recently I did one recently. I did a remake with the new ish. But what do you think? Nowadays, and honestly, I would say nowadays, especially since it's just harder to go viral, I would say once you get above like 500,000, most people would probably say a million, but like I think that's a level of 500,000 people is quite a lot of people, at least in my mind. But that's a lot, especially when I'm in a room with like 200 people and I look around, I'm like, holy crap, this is 200. I'm like, ooh. But anywho, this trend where I pretty much just went through and was going through a scam. And again, a scam is different than just a myth, but that's what we really try and fix. I think about this industry is Mm -hmm. about people just ripping others off because what we've talked about, especially it's bigger in the supplement industry, but especially when it comes to the training, the workouts, the diets, the whatever people are trying to profit because a lot of these companies trends, people don't realize they're really good marketing companies. They're not great scientific companies. They're Mm -hmm. good marketing companies. And I think that's the biggest problem that people don't realize is it's not hard to get into this industry and to sell anything related to health. It's really not anybody on the street could go ahead and do it with zero background. And that's where all these scams kind of come from. And that's where it kind of hurts. Myths are annoying, but scams hurt because it's like, well, wait a second. I just wasted how much money, time, energy, effort on all this crap. Yeah. I mean, if Tony and I wanted to start a supplement today, we literally could (laughs) like, we, I don't know if we wanted to start some greens powder, we could, you don't need anything to go make a greens powder and you could say whatever you want about it. And people make a lot of money from it. I was going to say, if we had to That's start a scam. a scam supplement, would you go greens or would you go BCA? What would you go for? If we wanted to make a buck and then just dip, go live in Bora, I would, Bora. If I wanted to make a buck from a product, I would make a greens powder and I would get every single skinny blonde fitness influencer to hop on it based off of its ability to reduce bloating and heal your gut. I think it'd be big because those those profit (laughs) margins are huge too on greens powders because they're usually one of the more expensive products too, but that might be saved for part one or part two. So today we're going over, we have, again, we went down a list of top 10 today is part one. So we're going to go 10 down to six. And then next week we're going to finish up with five, four, three, two, and one, right? So we're going to get these things rolling. Actually, you know what I wanted to bring up? Cause this is just a cute little thought that I saw and heard the mm-hmm. other day. I have zero, I didn't fact check this. So th- then this is nothing to do with what we're talking about today. <laughs> but just a little heartwarming thought maybe to start someone's week. Did you know, like, you know, when someone says like, I love you to the moon and back, you heard that before? Yeah. You said that before? That's I forget. It, I love it. Love you to the moon and back. It's adorable. Yeah. But someone told me, that your heart pumps about 2,000 ca- or 2,000 gallons of blood per day, which is equivalent to the amount of gasoline it would take you to drive from the earth to the moon and back. So when someone tells you that they love you to the moon and back, they're basically saying that every time their heart beats, they love you. It's kind of cute. Oh, wow. That was really nice and wholesome, Tony. I've been thinking about that for like a week. But even now I'm thinking about that. I feel like that's really far off because the moon's kind of far away. <laughs> I'm going to fact check that. Sorry if I just misled you, but it's adorable. (laughs) Okay. So anyway, back on topic, we're doing 10 down to six today, and we're going to try and break these down with science, explain to you why they're wrong, because this is what I didn't realize is on these viral videos, I really thought people knew that these were scams. I thought people fully understood this. And what I could tell from the thousands of comments is that people still don't understand why some of these 
are scams, why they are completely useless, essentially, or sometimes even harmful and a complete waste of money. I had no idea that this was still a problem. Yeah. Was that me being, yeah. being naive? No, no. It's I have to remind myself that too, but it's why these things don't disappear, right? It's because people still genuinely believe it. And every single one of these that we're going to go through this week and next, there is a successful scam has an emotional tie to it. No, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be overt, but you target someone else's emotions, an emotion about a topic that is very relatable. People feel similarly about a problem and or something that needs fixing. And yeah. there you have to elicit that emotional response, whether it be positive or negative. And that's why these succeed. Because when you get into these personal emotions, personal biases, it doesn't matter what anyone else tells you. That's where a lot of people, I mean, that's not our audience, at least mm -mm. people who especially want to learn listening to us, but Critical you see thinkers. that a lot on TikTok and that's like the target audience. And that's, well, I'm not gonna lie. We so do have a pretty, we have a dope, we have a pretty dope audience. <laughs> I'm not gonna yes. lie. Like when listeners message and DM us, I'm like always like, oh dang, I, like these people are dope. I wish mm -hmm. everyone just lived right here so we can have one big party. I know. So thank y'all for being so dope and not little weirdos <laughs> and critical thinkers. Now, let's jump into it. Start off the list. Now, we got number 10 we're going to start the mm -hmm. day off with. What do we got? So this is the craze that is healing your gut. And I was going back and forth with how to title this, but it really is this whole idea of using this concept of healing your gut to sell a product. And that is the scam. The idea that there is something wrong with your gut health and something can fix it. This gut health craze mm -hmm. as a whole has turned into a modern day marketing ploy fed yeah. by the weight loss and supplement industry. And I was going to say, you see this all over the place, right? Like what, like all over the place, some examples. All I know like AG one bloom green supplements, the glutamine, right? Like tons of examples. Yeah. Any D bloat pill. There's a pill called bye bye bloat digestive enzymes. CMOS has played into it. Parasite cleanses. People will say it about Olipop, which I'm drinking right now, certain probiotics. And this claim, whether it's from influence, influencer marketing, whether it's from targeted ads, whether it's on the label, whether it's on the website, sometimes it doesn't even come from the company and it's just the consumers yeah. who will say this that this is going to heal your gut or it's going to heal something related to your digestion, bloating. And it's gotten so out of hand because yes, poor digestion, poor gut health, digestive disorders, diseases, they're real and they're debilitating for a lot of people. And they're very complicated and complex and a lot of people don't get answers or aren't taken seriously. I'm not at all saying that gut health or having yeah. poor gut health is a scam or something that's made up. I didn't want that to get misconstrued, but rather the way companies have used and manipulated a complex topic to sell products based off of yes. a very common insecurity and problem people face, like bloating or like being in being uncomfortable after you eat a meal or having any sort of digestive distress. I mean, the majority of of people have experienced that at some point. Well, especially even I'm thinking with how it's cool because of how much, would you say even the last just decade from a science perspective, it's become very apparent how important gut health is and how really oh, yeah. complicated and complex your gut is. So mm -hmm. it's like that has a huge potential to have an impact on our health. So that even if someone's not experiencing like discomfort or anything else, just the thought of having quote unquote good gut health is something sellable. Right. Like, yes. I think that's to anybody. It's like gut health. We understand. But that's what I'm noticing about a lot of these scams is there's like a kernel of truth, but they yeah. just take it and sell it for the completely wrong reasons. And I, I was, as you were saying that, like, you don't want to say that gut health is a scam or gut health's not important. I'm like, holy crap. That's because all of these scams that, I, that we listed together, I realized do the same thing. It's like an important topic. It's just being mm -hmm. sold and marketed in, a, in such a wrong way. That's yes. so crazy. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. And to kind of put this into perspective and really understand, I mean, just understanding 
how complex our gut microbiome is and how complicated it is can show you how but there's no such thing as a cure all and you can't completely understand what might be com- making your gut health out of whack there are so many different factors that go into it there is your sleep there is meal timing there is maybe you have some sort of intolerance maybe you have a digestive disease maybe you have anxiety depression there are so many things that can influence your gut health so Understanding that and then also understanding that the human gut microbiota is an integral part of health and it's associated with a variety of different diseases because there is a complex ecosystem of 300 to 500 bacterial different species, that's species as a whole. So that's where you get into the billions because there's so many different groups of these species. We have a whole episode on probiotics. We've talked about the gut brain connection. So we will link those in the show notes if you really want to hear more about those in detail. But they all play a huge role in so many other functions in our body. And we don't completely understand that role just yet. But they do also play a role in a lot of our metabolic activities. Your metabolic activities are all of the chemical processes going on in your body at a time. This is so complex and such a large topic to dive into. We don't even completely understand the relationship between these bacterial species and humans yet. We haven't gotten there to make these recommendations for specific products to target a specific species of bacteria and how it functions in someone's unique digestive tract. It's yeah. complex. <laughs> well, and that's what I'm like. I think that's where mar- from a marketing standpoint, it's really easy to market complex, but important things. But that's the yes. funniest part is if you ask anyone who's in the science or the realm of gut health, they will be the first to tell you, we don't really know what's going on. Like we, we don't have a full understanding. Like this is in its infant stages. Yeah. So that's always the funny part is, and it comes down to a lot of these too, where I think it's with gut health. It's like, well, maybe if you could name the specific problem with your gut, you could then start to lay out specific solutions for that specific problem. Mm -hmm. But just the idea that you could slap on one solution that just magically might fix hundreds, if not thousands of different problems is comical. And that's where I think like the L-glutamine for bloating, where we talked about, I think in the gut health episode, it's like for a small percentage of the population with under like with very low doses of glutamine in their gut already, very low percentage of the population, that mm-hmm. may help. Yeah. But that's not 90% of the people who are buying the L-glutamine supplement. So that's where the scan kind of comes in. Mm-hmm. But I think that's the easiest thing is if something's important yet complex, I feel like if you're a marketer, you're like jackpot. Yeah. I could sell you on this easy. But it is healthy. And this is where I think I even said, I think greens, powders, bloating, glutamine, stuff like that on the scam. The biggest question next was like, well, what do I do? Right. Like it doesn't solve the problem by saying, Hey, this doesn't fix it. It's Mm -hmm. like, what do we do? Right. What do we do next? Yeah. So instead of wasting $40 on Bloom's greens powder to cure your bloating, you can try to eat more fiber by focusing on plant diversity in your diet, getting more fruits, vegetables, whole grains. Next, drinking more water throughout the day is heavily underestimated and a lot of people don't do it. Going for a 10-minute walk after each large meal to get food moving. That you can is sip huge. On some, yeah. You can sip on some bitter teas or peppermint tea after meals to help relax your digestive system. Eating cooked vegetables over raw vegetables can be easier to digest. Having a regular eating schedule can help with gastric motility, which is the contraction of smooth muscle and allows food to move through your digestive system. And it is heavily influenced by your eating behaviors and regularity. And if you have a regular schedule, you can become more efficient at digesting that food. A lot of people don't really think about that part, which is huge. And then another piece could be limiting carbonated beverages and chewing gum because that can promote Ooh. some bloating and discomfort. It's not none of these are going to cure your gut health if you genuinely have an underlying 
disease. However, this can help with a lot of the symptoms of either bloating, discomfort after meals that are more general and a lot of people suffer with, but aren't usually an indicator that you have a huge issue. Some people may need a little bit more interventions than others. Some people may need more medical attention than others. Some of these symptoms may be a sign that you do actually have an underlying problem that needs medical help, but they're still easy points of entry that can make your life a little bit better, can make digestion a little bit easier. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I'm a little uncomfortable because you didn't just try and sell me something. No, I didn't. None, none of those I, things I were another supplement to add in. What are you talking yeah. about? You're not trying to sell Maybe me peppermint supplement. tea. Maybe peppermint okay. tea. Uh, yeah. But yeah, and it's funny too because – and this is just anec- an anecdote I want to add in because there's no research. But I really want to know if – because we know that our gut and our brain are – directly connected. They influence each other. Mm -hmm. I really do wonder if when people taking these supplements, if because they believe that they're going to work, if that relaxes their digestive system a little bit. So that mental piece of- Placebo is more real than anything else. So I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Because being stressed about what you're eating, and this is studied, I actually really do recommend our gut-brain connection episode to understand this more, but, but being stressed and going into a meal, really stressed about what you're eating or having chronically elevated cortisol levels can heavily impair digestion and how you digest your food. So I do wonder if you're thinking, oh, I'm having this pill. So obviously I'm not going to be bloated. I'm going to be fine if I eat this. That would be fun to look at. That would actually be really fun. Okay. I have a question on the last piece. I never thought about this, but Chewing gum, making you bloated or carbonated mm. beverages, is that just because when you're chewing or drinking these things, is it the uh, like you're breathing the air. In actually like your air into your stomach? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're swallowing oh, okay. a lot of air when you chew gum. And for some people, this can happen. And it's this I would definitely recommend if you have IBS, bubbly beverages and chewing gum can be something that could be a big culprit of it. But that's more so just a general piece for anyone that they could experience bloating if they have more air that they're swallowing and, and then, then the air gonna, bubbles from like carbonated beverages like baby. i have olipop and i look like i drank two beers after <laughs> and it's just i have ibs and i'm so prone to bloating from anything bubbly i love it it goes down it goes away after like an hour i'm fine but yeah. olipop isn't the problem at all i'm just a little bit yeah a little bloating is also not always a bad thing <laughs> i think people no. always forget I, that was my favorite. I think I talked about this. One of my friends, Caroline, she's a dietitian. Did I tell you about that? The like the bag analogy that she used, where it's like she took like an empty plastic grocery bag, mm-hmm. and she's like, okay, this is your stomach, and then she dropped like a couple pieces of food in it, like a banana, an apple, yeah. a diet coke, and then the bag just obviously it's holding all these things, so it got bigger. She's like, half the time you aren't even bloated, you just have food in your stomach. Like that's what <laughs> happens when you put food in your stomach. Yeah, and I'm and like, how many of- people is that what it is? That's like a before and after picture with Bloom. You see people. Oh, yeah. And it's honestly offensive. It will be a girl who maybe just has like a lump because she maybe drank water. And then she's like, look at what happened after I drank Bloom. And it's like A lot of people are like, I would kill the look like you're starting <laughs> like, <laughs> your before photo. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Uh, okay. So that is so yeah. number 10. 10. Number 10. We got a big one. Number nine I'm excited about. And this one we're going to group two together. Right? So number 10 all about the gut health. Number nine, testosterone boosting supplements or hormone balancing supplements. And we're going to put these two together, but we're going to, we're going to break them down side by side, but here's why it's a scam, right? And here's what it is. We'll start with testosterone boosters. Cause I think that's a massive market today, especially when it comes to men. I know that's what we were talking about. Like for women, an easy marketing tactic is this will cure your bloating or your gut health. That's what they say to target a lot of women. Same thing for guys. Anything that is claimed to boost your testosterone, sales just go through the roof, right? Sales Mm go off the charts. But a testosterone booster, and I want to make this clear, is just a dietary supplement to like typically just vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and mostly herbs, I think a lot of the time, that aim to increase your testosterone levels naturally. So not a steroid. This is not actual testosterone. This is not TRT or blasting steroids or anything else. This is an HCG or Clomid. This is a natural legal 
method to supposedly boost testosterone. And I think over time, and I can't wait till we actually have a full testosterone episode who we want to get an expert on for. But I know we talked about this a lot with Derek when we were on the show with More Plays, More Dates. Testosterone, especially if you're male, but even it plays a massively important role for females too. I don't think they understand this to the full part, but it improves almost every aspect of your life. Your physical health, it makes it easier to build muscle, to lose fat, having higher testosterone levels, to improve your strength, to recover, not just from injury, but from the gym as well. I don't think people realize how large of an effect it plays on your cognition and mental health, not only drive memory recall, um, but actually mood and preventing depression. I know that was a big one that we talked about too. One of the big signs of low T in men is depression. It's coupled together very often. And then even just life, improving your sleep, your sex drive, Improving your testosterone, especially from a male stand like point of view, is usually there, there's not a lot of bad side effects that are marketed, right? It's like, you could, look at all this you could have. Yeah. But the hard part is, and I think this is what I want to break down, is looking at some of these ingredients because there's a lot of different specific ingredients. And that's where we want to be today, right? Is we want to be specific because that's going to be the same problem with hormone balancing supplements. It's like, well, which of the 50 plus hormones are you <laughs> quote unquote balancing? But in what mechanism are you using to do that? It's like, no, we're just... Here's a supplement that does it all. Whole thing, the whole thing. If you just take two seconds to think about balancing your hormones, what the fuck does that even mean? And no one, sorry, I'm sorry. No one even talks about it. Like no one even says what this means. Balancing it for who? Your balanced hormones or mine? Well, that's what I was going to say. Because Balancing <laughs> for me could mean lowering a certain hormone. Balancing for you could mean raising a certain hormone. And yeah. there might be some intervention that could either raise or lower a specific hormone production, but there's not one that just magically brings you to a solid level in the middle and balance. That, that's the hormone <laughs> balancing equation that cracks me up. But again, hormones are, I think, same, same issue with the digestion and the gut health. The endocrine system is extremely complex, mm -hmm. extremely complex. And I think we talked about that last week's episode in the nutrient absorption episode, the difference between complicated and complex, complex meaning things are very interdependent on each other. So raising testosterone doesn't just mean you're doing one thing, but that's going to have a downstream effect that's going to affect dozens of other things in unpredictable ways, right? So it's a very complex system, but it's an easy solution to sell a supplement that'll fix it, right? And I think this is, I wanted to put a few things in perspective because there's a few common ones. And I think the hottest one today is, is, Tongat Ali that we're going to talk about a little bit, but some of the common ones, if you just look at like the natural, you go down to GNC and you see a tea booster, you're going to see a lot of deaspartaic acid, which is a common one. And in rodent in vitro studies, it should increase testosterone to a pretty decent level. But in humans, when you look at the data and I recommend anybody to, when it comes to supplements, one of our favorite resources is examine.com where you can, it's a free resource. There's a paid version that I know Mariana and I use to collect research for this, these episodes, but there's a free version. Oh, you get a discount too. on if you uh, join Fitness Stuff Premium. Yeah, in the premium side, you get a discount on the premium version if you're really deep into the research. But it's a free resource if you want to go use it where you can type in deaspartaic acid and it collects all research done on this supplement and reviews it for you as far as here's to what degree of effect. Where are these studies done? Is it in rodents? Is it in humans? Are there even studies in the first place? And it does a really good job of grading the effect size the whole nine yards. It's incredible. But... In humans for deaspartaic acid, the results are all over the place, right? With most studies showing no impact at all, but some research, and it's not the most sizable research, but even showing increases up to 42% boost of testosterone. But here's the caveat with that, right? There was one study that showed in healthy men an increase in 42% testosterone, but it's in very short terms when highly dosed, meaning in the first 12 days, you saw a sharp increase. And then at the three week mark, it was back down to baseline and normal, mm. right? If you take it, it just, it doesn't maintain. And then every week after that, it doesn't maintain, which I think people in setting these expectations, and I'm going to talk about this more with Tongat Ali, there's statistically significant and something that's meaningful in research, but then there's something that's like meaningful as to what does that actually mean to your results? What does that actually mean yeah. when it comes to building muscle? What does it actually mean to like, are For you going to notice a difference? that you can Ex make for the population of interest. <sighs> exactly. Exactly. Which, I mean, when we come to this, because I mean, all the other ones typically are all mechanism based, but when you study them in human, for example, fenugreek, tribulus, ter terrestris, another common one that you see in a lot of these tea boosting supplements, 
they have mechanisms that should play out, but whenever you test it in humans, nothing happens to their testosterone, especially in healthy males. Ashwagandha, the only one that I think used to be hot a little bit, they, you only notice an increase in testosterone if you have low testosterone to begin with, more specifically like hypogonadism, meaning underperforming or damaged testy production. And that's it. In normal, healthy men, it doesn't inter- impact testosterone at all. But Tongat Ali, I think this is the one that Huberman kind of started the grass fire on and has got some traction. I don't want to discredit this one because it's actually, it's your comia long folia, right? The Tongat Ali. It actually has some decent. Wait, re- what? can you say that again? What's it called? Well, your comia <laughs> long uh, What did I say? No, I just wanted to make you say it again. <laughs> oh, screw you. I was like, what? Did I screw it up? I was like, I was practicing with a cork in my mouth beforehand. So I didn't. God, it's making me sweat. But, and there's actually, I think this was either in 2021 or 2022, researchers in South Africa put together a systematic review and meta analysis. It was over five RCTs, and they actually found a couple consistent increases in healthy men, not just men with low testosterone, when supplementing with higher doses of Tongat Ali anywhere from 10 to 20%. And these increases were actually lasting, not just one or two weeks, but actually lasting. And people, I think, see that and they go, holy crap, wow. And because 10 to 20%, again, statistically very significant, but I want to break it down. Like, what does that mean to you when it comes to building muscle, when it comes to sex drive, when it comes to losing fat, when it comes to recovery, to sleep, all these things that testosterone can do. Just to break this down, for example, let's say someone has a starting testosterone total testosterone of about 600 nanograms per deciliter is how it's commonly measured. A 10 to 20% increase would mean that you're increasing that 600 to 660 or 620. It's an absolute increase. So 660 to six or 720, which are like, dang, maybe at the high end, right? Like 600 to 720, that's a pretty big jump, right? But here's the thing that I don't think most people realize is that's typically not anywhere close to what you would need to actually notice a difference in your day-to-day cognition, muscle building, sex drive, anything like that. It's not enough to actually elicit a difference where just to like lay it out, the common TRT or testosterone replacement therapy would take that same person at like 600 nanograms per deciliter, and it would raise them anywhere from let's say 800 to 1200 nanograms per deciliter. So close to doubling it in a lot of those cases. And obviously it's a lot, depending on where you're starting from, how you respond to it, how much actual medication you're taking, but it would raise you close to double, right? And that's where if you're taking TRT, typically you actually start when you have low T, right? So below about three, 320. So that's when you'd notice those massive jumps is because you're actually usually seeing all the symptoms of low T to begin with. And then if you really want to see like the physical differences, if you look at a bodybuilder doing testosterone cycle and usually testosterone Look at more plates, more dates, Derek, for more information if you're interested on this. But testosterone is generally just the base steroid that a lot of these bodybuilders competing at high levels take. And then they stack multiple other steroids on top of that. And even at their base, a common test cycle would raise a bodybuilder's circulating levels up and over 3,000 nanograms per deciliter. So this isn't a jump from 600 to 700. This is a jump from 600 to 3,000 that's making a large impact on their physique, right? So the thing that I wanted to highlight here and why I think this is a big scam is it's easy to market an insecurity in men. And especially when it comes to, even if you're just using the, what the research says is studied, Tongat Ali, which can make a little bit of an improvement. It's nowhere close to where you're going to notice any sort of difference in muscle building, fat loss, recovery. You might notice an increase in sex drive that's been reported commonly, but that's more from like a, user's perspective. It's hard to measure that, but it's not enough to make a meaningful difference. And that's why I think this one's a big scam is people don't quite understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And it does what that this is the pattern, right? It's like, mm, I feel like low, I can't speak to it. Obviously I'm not a man, but low testosterone is a huge insecurity and something that it elicits this, it's fear, which is an emotion. And it's Mm -hmm. something that a lot of men don't want to have happen. And that there is this defensiveness. If you believe that something might be working for you, there is this want to share that there's this want to share this information. There's this want to then have companies noticing this and Mm -hmm. saying, this is a really good area for us to 
jump into and use and manipulate because people feel very strongly in favor of yeah. this topic they and want it. anything that will improve it. Yeah. And even if you're not insecure about the low testosterone piece, it's like who wouldn't want to build muscle easier, lose fat easier, sleep better, have higher sex? Who wouldn't want all these things? You know, it's like, here's all these good things we're going to dangle. And that's, again, we know that just from a common theme on this episode, like in the supplement industry, it's the wild west. You can say literally almost anything you want to market a supplement. It doesn't have to be true, which I think shocks a lot of people. Yeah. But before we go into how we could actually like a solution for this, because I think there is something, and especially that we talked about with Derek, a big one. I just wanted to touch again on the hormone balancing supplements, which is another big one. I think marketed to both men and women. It just stems back to that original problems. You can manipulate and change certain hormones to elevate, to limit. For example, ashwagandha does a really good job at actually reducing blood cortisol levels. But again, balancing would mean that you're bringing people to kind of like a middle level. And not only one is there a problem with everyone's going to have a different baseline that's going to be right for them. Right. For yeah. men in testosterone, some people feel great at 900. Some people feel great at 400. Right. Neither one is it, it's more individual dependent. So that's mm -hmm. the first problem. And then second, if you actually just take the time, just if you see any hormone balance supplement or if you have one, just to be curious, go to examine.com, look at the back of your bottle and type in those ingredients that they're using. And I promise you all of them are going to come up the exact same. Zero human trials done. Zero actual effect. It's something that's easy to sell. It's mm -hmm. something that's easy to sell because we're taking this complex thing. It's like, oh, well, you can't lose fat. You're depressed because your hormones. That's, it's just like a blanket statement. It's like, but we can fix that with this supplement. So mm -hmm. that's really where it comes from. And I think more so, and more, Derek actually changed my perspective on this. A solution is not per se what can boost your testosterone, adding on top of your current diet, but it's like you actually see the biggest jumps and increases in just simply filling in the voids of what's deficient in your current diet. So a lot of people, for example, in testosterone boosting supplements will say, oh, well, zinc boosts testosterone. And that's true only if you're deficient in zinc to begin with. If you have normal zinc levels, zinc does nothing. And that's where I think a good solution is use an app like, uh, is it Chronometer? Use Chronometer to track your food for a week. And it does a really incredible job of breaking down your micronutrient intake, your vitamins, your minerals down to the last drop. And see, okay, where am I falling short? Where am I not? Vitamin D, magnesium, zinc. A lot of these, if you are deficient in, you'll notice a boost in testosterone when you actually hit your needs, right? That's actually huge. So I would say that's step yeah. one. Step two is if you're constantly in a calorie deficit, if you're starving yourself, typically your endocrine system is what gets suppressed first when you're in a long-term deficit. That's why you see people, bodybuilders, stepping onto shows with their endocrine system crushed, just because they're at such, such a low body fat percentages. They've been dieting for 16, 30 weeks sometimes, right? So eating at your calorie maintenance, actually giving your body, isn't that weird? Your body actually appreciates it when you feed it what it needs, right? And then just the basics of sleep hygiene, stress management, that's, if anyone's claiming to boost your testosterone to a meaningful amount, that's outside of your diet, your sleep, your stress, it's not going to be to a meaningful impact unless it's actual steroids. Like that's just what it comes down to. Yeah. I just also want to make a quick note too for women in relation to their cycle, which you can absolutely have hormone levels that are either too high or too low, which it's, can be called an imbalance, but there's a lot more. That's a very regulated topic in terms of what levels for people to look out for and for mm. practitioners to look out for that are very streamlined. But if you're not eating enough and you don't have a cycle, if you have lost your menstrual cycle, that is going to completely aff negatively affect your yeah. hormones and the production of your sex hormones. So not just, you know, getting all caught up in what foods are balancing out your hormones. Maybe take a look at how much you're eating. If you've ever had an experience where you have lost your menstrual cycle, make sure you're not over exercising or under eating. That's just a quick note. I know that that's a smaller population of people, but it happens I, I to a lot of people. It's still that's not very apparent. About. Yeah. Is it? It's yeah. amenorrhea, right? When you amenorrhea. lose your period, a lot of people that are anorexic see that. Yeah. Hypothalamic amenorrhea. And mm. it's largely due to not enough food, <laughs> not enough yeah. energy intake and over exercise. 
you see it a lot in female athletes as well as part of like the female athlete triad. And it's it at the time. I mean, I went through it for three years and I was like, this is great. You don't care. You're just when you're young, it it really happens. And women like is the largest population that it affects is women in their early Mm. 20s. And it's not really taken seriously. And you don't it's just important to consider the effects that that can have a lot down the line and to intervene there. But I just think it's people don't talk about it much. It doesn't seem like it's taken seriously for younger women. Like, I feel like you hear stories about that all the time. It's like, oh, well, what happens? Like, oh, nothing. I just don't like just went along with life. But that's also the greater context. And I'm not usually this person, but that's the greater mentality that just, I feel like women as a whole have to have around their cycles. Just kind of like, well, this is what it is. Deal with it or don't deal with it. (laughs) Like, Okay. That's actually a fair point too. That's yeah. definitely a fair point. Yeah. All right. So that is where it comes down to number nine. So we went over the gut health scam. We went over hormone balancing, testosterone boosting scam. What is it coming in at number eight? This I one I love. This one. this one I love because I don't think a lot of mm-hmm. people talk about it. I just made a TikTok on this a few weeks ago. But this is number eight is food sensitivity tests. I almost forgot this. But then I was like, wait, no, this is one of, I would say, like, a thousand percent. I, I, yeah, but it's and it's not as I don't think they're as popular now, or maybe I just don't see as much marketing for it now. But I know that this has scammed so many people. So let's talk about it. And first, let's talk about differences between food allergies and intolerances, because people will confuse the two. They'll say, "Oh, I have this sensitivity," and then also say it's an intolerance and confuse them. So. Mm-hmm. Food allergies happen when your immune system reacts to a substance, which is usually a protein in a food or group of foods. And food intolerances are not an immune system reaction. So this is a very baseline Hmm. entry-level definition. We're not going really deep. But an intolerance is not – they relate to trouble digesting food. So think of lactose intolerance. So they can – occur due to a lack of an enzyme needed to digest certain foods or sometimes as a reaction to additives or naturally occurring compounds in foods that you are incapable of digesting due to a known underlying reason. So individuals with food intolerances may be able to eat small amounts of bothersome foods, think lactose, dairy, but when they have too much, their body may react negatively to it. So that's an intolerance. A food sensitivity has no standard medical definition. It can be used to mean absolutely anything. And sometimes it's used instead of a food intolerance. You will hear sulfite sensitivity, histamine sensitivity, gluten sensitivity. It's Other times it may be used as like a, a catchphrase almost to sell a product. You used, are you sensitive to this food? That's what um, I've heard a million times. Yeah. And the evidence is there's completely lacking in terms of any s- support that the use of these tests are helpful in diagnosing any adverse reactions to foods. So let's talk about these tests. These tests cost hundreds of dollars, essentially for people to tell you what you're already eating. So how is that? In the case of a food allergy, so a skin prick or a blood test, that measures a protein called immunoglobulin E or IgE. And those are used to help diagnose these food allergies. The presence of IgE antibodies generally indicates an immune system response. However, Food sensitivity tests look for the presence of IgG antibodies in the blood and determine a sensitivity based off of high levels of IgG antibodies, not IgE. It's important to understand. So IgG antibodies have not been shown to be reliable in identifying either a food allergy or sensitivity, I'm saying in air quotes, They, IgG antibodies rise in the blood due to frequent consumption of those foods or recent exposure. So foods you eat often, a lot of, or just had recently will cause IgG levels in the blood to rise. (laughs) They are not specific to a person's sensitivity, 
but past or frequent exposure to a food may cause them to be high. It's not a coincidence that people taking these tests find they are sensitive to all of the foods that they eat all of the time. That is not a coincidence. This test is telling you the foods you are tolerant to. That's all it does. And I cannot think of, I genuinely personally think that this is one of the biggest scams and I don't understand how that it is still out there. Is blowing my mind still like that, that is seriously like the storybook definition of a scam. It's literally because that's what it is, is food sensitivity tests. Usually people take them when they're struggling to lose weight, to build to whatever they are, they're struggling. So they take one. And then it's like, oh, no wonder it's because this thing that I eat all the time mm -hmm. is in my way. That's hilarious because it's always it's every single time. It's oh, it's this thing that I eat every single day, but it's not because that's literally the intention of that test. Yeah. Do. And there is. So for anyone who maybe is listening that has had one of these tests and they told you you were sensitive to a food that you never have, you've never eaten, you've never eaten recently, you can't remember mm -hmm. the last time you've had it. This sometimes will happen because you can have results that say you are sensitive to foods that you never eat due to cross reactivity. So this is when the, pro the protein structure in some foods is similar to foods you do eat often. That is known as cross reactivity. It is recognizing this food that you never eat mm. because you do eat a food with a similar protein structure. Okay, so not even a similar food, but just something with a similar protein structure. Yeah, so because a lot of proteins in foods can have similar structures, that's why these are, I mean, another reason why they're so flawed. They can't, sometimes they will misinterpret that for a different food. So say it that tells you that me. you have a sensitivity to cheese and you don't remember the last time you've had cheese, you hate it, but you do know that you eat a lot of I don't know, Greek yogurt, who knows? If those protein structures are similar, this test could confuse them and pick that Greek yogurt up as cheese and tell you that your sensitivity is cheese. What the, f okay. And I don't know if those have similar protein structures. I mean, they're both dairy, but yeah. that was just an example. <laughs> well, this is killing me because, okay, if this, had, if this was more popular, 100%, I'm like, this should be number one. As far as yeah, there was wise. a time like, when it was really like Everly and you still see people here and there, but it, I would say it was like kind of right before, I'd say like 2018, 2019, it was super popular. Yeah, I, I still that. see them every now and then. And especially with my video that I made recently, so many people had recently taken them or were considering it. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize this was still that popular. And there's, because of this lack of of evidence to support making changes based off of food sensitivity findings. These are not typically recommended by allergists. So professional organizations that specialize in the treatment of food allergies, they don't recommend IgG testing. They advise against IgG testing. And this is why insurance companies typically don't cover the cost of these tests because there's no that evidence is to support that they're useful well, I'm, for anything. I'm glad they're here on the list because I think you're right. I don't think they're po as popular as they used to be. But like, I think for a lot of these things, like I think testosterone boosters, I think a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, those are kind of scammy. Or mm -hmm. the same thing with like, OK, well, OK, the greens powders, they're starting to understand like, those are kind of scammy. I don't think the food sensitivity tests are as popular, but I also don't think just because they're not as popular, I still don't think people, even this is on their radar as something that's not a scam. They just might not be aware of it. Yeah. It's, and this is why- It's almost some, hilarious to a point. I have a really hard time with the whole sensitivity thing because there's no basis for a sensitivity. There, there, you can be, anyone can eat foods and respond poorly to them. S I know that every single time that I have a cheese platter, I'm going to I'm going to not feel so great. For example, it could be literally anything under the sun. Mm. It could even be a healthy food. Some people every time they have apples for whatever reason, they don't feel good. You can say, "Yeah, I'm sensitive to apples." For sure. That is 
you have some response that is continuous every single time. It is predictable how your body is going to respond. Yeah, I'm sensitive to these. You don't have an apple sensitivity. Your body just maybe does not respond so great to apples. That is very normal to yeah. not have supreme digestion. But there is yeah. no way to diagnose a sensitivity. It's not a clinically relevant term. There is no definition for it. There is nothing that could tell you you have a sensitivity because it's made up. It is made. There is nothing that says that this is a sensitivity. Absolutely, you can be sensitive to foods. But knowing that you have this sensitivity has to mean that there's some clinical meaning. It has to be clinically relevant. What does that mean? There is none. Wow. So wow. I get really heated about that. Okay, I'm, I pumped that. That. I'm glad that made the list. Because I know when we were talking it, you're like, holy crap, we almost forgot it. I'm glad that yeah. made the list. I mean, talk about like as someone who did take one and – I was in a point where I was really struggling so much and going through so many doctors that weren't taking mm -hmm. me seriously. I was spending so much. I was that person spending so much money on yeah. the supplements. I would just, I was holding on to hope. Anything that could possibly help me, even though there was a point where I got delusional, I was like, nothing is going to work, but I'm still going to buy it and try it. Mm -hmm. I get it. Like I am empathetic from that standpoint. Like I do get it. And I feel like sometimes if I didn't keep trying after all those years, I wouldn't have found a doctor that took me seriously. So I totally get it. But I do feel so passionately about trying to help people prevent going down yeah. that road of wasting a lot of time and money. Yeah. I was going to say, because even, even afterwards, it might waste even more time and energy because that's where you're going to start to put your time and yes. energy is fixing this sensitivity or avoiding yeah. that. Even though it's just a pointless, it's a rabbit trail that's going to lead to nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Dang. Okay. All we right. Well, that's my, heated, that's my heated okay, moment. We got a good, I think this is a good list so far. I'm getting more heated up and loving this even more. Step by step. Okay, so we started off the gut health scamming industry, the hormone balancing, testosterone boosting, the food sensitivity. I think that was my favorite so far, leading us into number seven of the day, which this one might be the biggest umbrella that we have. And we've yeah. talked about it on this podcast a few times before in certain contexts, but I think it deserves a spot on this list. And this is any workout, supplement, or product that sells you on fat burning, on fat burning. So for example, fat burning supplements, which are more fundamentally misleading. The 12, 3, 30 workout, not a bad workout, not a scam as a workout, but it just doesn't magically help you lose fat than anything else. We're going to talk about why, or even the common, I don't know. Have you heard of the Lumen product? L-U-M-E-N? Oh, I have. Yeah. I got actually got a lot of hate on that one because that was one of the first ones in my video. And it's essentially, it's a cool, it's a cool device. And we're going to break this down because all of these do have a sliver of truth. Again, a little kernel of truth, but they're fundamentally just misleading from the most basic level, right? Because waste, I mean, supplements alone, weight loss supplements last year, the market was around $44 billion globally. And that's predicted to be over 135 billion by just 2030, right? This is a huge market that this is where a lot of people spend their money on, right? And this, mm -hmm. this is a big piece of it. But the Lumen device cracks me up a little bit because if you're unfamiliar, if you're listening to this, it scientifically, it, in the marketing they do, it comes off kind of like AG1, where it's very professional, very science forward. And you're like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is genius. And it's, it's kind of cool because the basis of their product works really well. And it's essentially you have this handheld device that you take a long, deep exhale in. And it tells you in that moment whether you are predominantly burning fat for fuel or carbs for fuel. And it tells you in that moment. And that's True. They actually do a good job about that. You can tell just by measuring carbon concentration or CO2 concentration in the breath, what, what someone's using as a primary source of fuel. And this is what we've talked about. I think it can't be less than a dozen times on this. The fat burning, not being the same thing as losing fat conversation. Yeah. And that's why there it kind of comes down for, but this is why it's sellable is because yes, you can change scenarios. You can change what you're doing during the day. You can change your workouts to where you are burning more fat than carbs compared to other workouts or other activities through the day, right? So there is such thing as a quote unquote fat burning zone that you can be put into, right? I mean, you go out th throughout the day, just using multiple sources of energy just to stay alive, right? Your total daily energy expenditure, the biggest piece is that BMR, just keeping you from dying, right? That takes mm -hmm. up a lot of energy. Most of this is coming from fats and carbs. All right. And when you're at rest, right, like probably when most of you guys are listening to this podcast, even though shout out to those doing your cardio on this one, 
I know. I feel like a lot of people listen to pod- I listen to podcasts when I'm walking or doing uh, that's, cardio. I get a lot of tags when people are going on walks and stuff like that. I'm like, shout out to yeah. you. Even though that's still low intensity. When you're at rest or at lower intensity, the majority of your fuel or the calories and the energy that you're needing are going to be used from fat. They're going to be breaking down and burning fat. Even if you're just sitting on the couch, you're burning more fat than if you're doing something a lot more strenuous, like high intensity training, like some sprinting, really anything that gets your heart rate over 80% your max of your max heart rate, you're going to be burning very, very little fat for fuel and mostly carbohydrates. And I think this is another one of those complexity layers. If you're listening to this, you're like, well, I still don't get it. Like, why would I not want to burn more fat? If I want to lose fat, why would I not want to burn more fat? And there's a problem, right? And we've talked about this before, and I think we'll link another episode that we did deeper, just not to spend too much time. Burning fat is the simple act of fat oxidation, i.e. the process of breaking down fatty acids to be used as fuel, where losing fat occurs over longer periods of time and is based not on how much fat you're burning in that very moment, but also how much fat you are storing. And here's the kind of cool thing about a few of these factors. One is when it comes down to trying to optimize, and this is the problem with lumen and fat burning workouts, right? Like I know a lot of these high intensity classes, like the circuit classes, that's what they promote. The 12, 330 workout, the lumen device, your body calibrates or balances fat to carb burning over a 24 hour period. So if you spend an hour working out and you're doing a very low intensity workout where you're burning predominantly fat, so high fat, low carb is fuel. Naturally, you're going to burn a little less fat and more carbs later in the day. And same thing goes vice versa. If I have a high intensity training session in the morning where I'm burning very little fat and mostly using carbs, my fat burning or fat oxidation will be higher later in the day than if I didn't, right? So it kind of has this little offset calibration where it comes down to not just how much you're burning in the moment, but how much you're storing over time. If you're burning more, you'll probably store more. That's what's the problem with like the keto diet. Oh, well, if you eat 95% fats, your body's going to use a lot more fat for energy. It's like, well, yeah, but you're also going to store a shit ton more fat into your cells. It comes down to calories in versus calories out. If mm-hmm. you're eating the same amount of energy through calories as you're spending, it doesn't matter if you're spending all day in this quote unquote magic fat burning zone, according to Lumen, anything else, you're going to store just as much fat. But if you're in a calorie deficit, that's when you give yourself that, that room to actually lose fat over time. And I think that's just the most misleading and fundamentally misleading part about all of this is all of these products are sold as the more you burn, the more you'll lose. I actually had a, I don't know if it was an exec or someone that works high up at the Lumen team DM me very long paragraphs of how wrong I was. And I'm like, it's not that your device doesn't work. I'm not saying that. I even covered this in my post. I'm like, the device works for what it does you are marketing it as something that fat burning is the same thing as losing fat. And they're like, no, we're not. And I take a screenshot from the multiple pieces on their website where it's like, this device helps you burn more fat, which is the goal of weight loss, whatever it is. It was fundamentally, it was just saying that. Yeah. And I'm like, that is scientifically untrue. That is what you are using as your scam. And that's why this comes down to a scam. And that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest thing with all they've this. They've reached out to me before to work together. Same. I just don't even answer. I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't even know who I – it's the weirdest thing when companies like that reach – I've been getting more recently and it's so frustrating. I'm just like, why on earth would you act like you have any idea what I talk about? Same. Yeah, it's like do you spend any time on my page before emailing me about wanting to work? That's the funniest part. And the Okay, the other funny part – sorry to pick on Lumen over the workouts because they're all fundamentally the same – it's hilarious because on their page, it's like, well, we've got real scientific experts backing this product. And then you look at it and it's like Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Jason oh. Dung, Dave Asprey. I forget what was the other girl's name. All of these people who are some of the biggest scam artists in the entire industry that if you're in the industry, you know this. You avoid these people like the plague because of what they actually say. It's hilarious. But if you're un knowing you're like, oh, these guys have best-selling books and these things, and this makes them credible. And it's the, that the Lumen thing is the funniest thing in the world because I think there's a lot of money and a lot of push behind the science of it. And it's just, it's so not evidence-based at all. None of it, none of it, none of it. So that's where this really kind of comes down to it. The Lumen device. Yeah. It works for what it is. Is that any useful data? 
Not at all. Let's round off the last one of part one before we finish off with part two next week. Number six. You want to start off with this one? We've talked about this a few times. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. BCAAs. We have a full episode on this. So if you really want to dive into this in Mm -hmm. detail, and Tony was just telling me about how this is still, these are still things people get pretty defensive about. Yeah. I never really talk about them. So I haven't, but I do know that I see people share it all the time. It's just a part of the fitness routine, supplement routine, and making claims like boosting muscle growth while both bulking, preserve muscle mass and maintain energy levels while cutting, improve how your body burns fat, improves recovery, even improving immunity. There is a large list it's a of cure-all. claims that come with BCAAs. It's but insane. It's, I personally feel like it. there might be this group of people that kind of knows that, but still takes it. You know what I mean? Like people I, who do know, but they're like, yeah, but this is a part of my routine. Well, I was going to say, so (laughs) this is the one that shocked me the most in the comments because I think in total between the – I posted it on both platforms. I think I got over 6,000 comments. And the BCAA one was the one that kept popping up where I I almost didn't add it to my video because I thought it was more well-known that this is just expensive water flavoring. It's a a complete waste of money. Mm -hmm. But that was the one that kept coming up in the comments like, wait, everything but the BCAA. Tell me that's not true. And then some people, it is funny. Some people are like, oh, I just like how it makes my water taste. I'm like, well, have you heard of like Mio, the little spray that is yeah. $2 at the grocery store and does the same exact thing. But it's, it is funny because this one's tricky because there is research supporting each of those claims actually showing this. It's like, well, wait a second. Yeah. There's actual human research supporting that it can help boost muscle growth, that it can help preserve muscle mass, that it can help maintain energy, improve how your body burns fat, all of these things. But there's a big caveat right? There's a big caveat. And I think this is where the discussion comes in just for a brief download, because I know we didn't explain what these were. One, we're going to link the episode down below too. There's BCAAs and there's EAAs, right? And just for a quick little rundown, your body's able to make 11 of the amino acids it needs, but it must obtain the final nine from the food you eat. These are called essential amino acids, the EAAs, right? BCAAs, branched chain amino acids, Those only contain leucine, isoleucine, and valine of those EAAs, right? So those are even fewer but more condensed. And I think that's a lot of people are like, oh, well, BCAAs are crap, but not EAAs. And it's like, well, pretty much the same freaking thing, dude, but actually to a lesser degree. But here's why these are a scam, right? There's human research that supports all of those claims, but there's one catch, one very important catch. It's only observed when the group taking BCAAs is below the daily minimum protein intake on top of that. Meaning they do not get enough protein through their day. BCAAs will then help prevent muscle loss, help muscle building. But here's the other part. Not once have any of those benefits been observed when the groups have even been meeting the minimum daily protein intake through their diet or other supplements like protein supplements. All of those vanish. Right, All of those vanish. And here's the problem. People are like, well, what if I don't get enough protein? That is a much bigger problem that you should solve first. That is a much bigger problem that you should solve. If you're not getting enough protein, don't go buy a $40 BCAA supplement. Go buy, I mean, buy a whey protein. So buy any protein supplement. I know. Or figure out how to eat more protein in your diet. Because I don't think people understand that. Like a pro, all a protein in is, is a large molecule just made up of chains of smaller compounds of amino acids. Like we say when we're talking about the strong inside, whey protein is a complete protein. It contains all nine essential amino acids. Soy protein is the only plant protein that is a complete protein. The absorption is different, but that contains all nine essential amino acids. If you are, I don't want, if you are vegan, if you're vegetarian, you're like, well, then I have to supplement because I'm not, eat a variety of plant proteins. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're making that choice, if you are making that choice, I'm like speaking to fucking 20 year old me. If you're making that choice to especially be a vegan, right? Especially be a vegan and you are not paying attention to protein intake. There is absolutely no world in which you can complain or ask for, this is a very special population of people. They have to take it. No. No, you have to combine a 
variety of different plant proteins and you'll be fine. That's how you get all of your essential amino acids. It's actually yeah. pretty easy if you just pay a little bit of attention to it. Yeah. Um, like I know pea and rice sources are really good sources as well. Right. Yeah. I don't know if they're fully complete, but they've got a wide variety outside. Of yeah. It and too. if you have that as, you know, like if you're having that, if you're having a plant protein powder during the day, if you're having some, maybe some beans, maybe you're having some tempeh or tofu at some point, you're having lentils. There you go. That's a variety. And just try to have a variety at each meal. Yeah. And I know Alan Aragon constantly says this. It's like watering your, your lawn when it's raining outside. When you're getting enough protein and you're taking BCAAs, you're adding nothing on top. You're getting zero, yeah. not a little bit, zero benefit from that, right? If you, and if you're like, I like the water flavoring. I don't know if you've heard of these cool little Mio packages. They're $2 at the local supermarket and you just spray it in whatever flavor your little heart desires. It'll flavor your water for you. Mm -hmm. And I think here's the big thing. If a company sells BCAAs, not only would I not buy the supplement, I wouldn't buy anything from that supplement. I wouldn't buy anything from that company altogether, anything that company sells. I, and Mark Matthews was on here. Remember when he was talking about this too? Yeah. Because I know Legion, that was the funny part, is he was saying that is the number one most requested supplement that company gets. Do you remember that part? And he's like, he, oh, he can yeah, make an yeah, easy yeah. couple extra million dollars a year. If mm -hmm. he wanted to sell BCAAs, but he doesn't just because he knows they're literally useless. Yeah. But that was the funniest part to me. But here's why I wouldn't buy anything that that, some, that company sells altogether is there's only two reasons why a company chooses to sell BCAAs. It's crystal clear according to all human research done, right? BCAAs, they do not have any benefit at all in regards to fat loss, muscle building, recovery, or anything else if you're getting enough protein in your diet. It takes a high school reading level to understand that. So this means one of two things if your company is selling BCAAs, which is a large part, I hate to poop on like Ghost, for example, because mm -hmm. like they have really good flavored proteins and stuff like that, but they sell BCAAs, which means one of two things, right? Either one, that the company is that oblivious when it comes to what they're putting in their products. They're that oblivious, they have no clue the science or efficacy behind what they're putting into their products. So who knows what else they could be putting into their other supplements or what's going on behind the scene when you're that uninformed. That's one meaning is they're just careless. And it's like, who wants to buy a supplement where they're that careless with what they put into it? Or two, the company is aware of how useless these supplements are. And they choose to lie to you in their marketing because they know it's a nearly $10 billion market and it's cheap and easy to produce. Those are the only two options that come down to it. And that's what kind of changed my mind about this is the whole, if you think about that, it's like, well, you're right. Does that mean that a supplement company can't make another high quality product? No. But that's saying one of two things, either they are fundamentally misleading you and they know it, or being a nutritional company, they are lacking the basic understanding of such a simple topic, of such a simple supplement. Yeah. That's a problem. That's why that's a scam. I, yeah. So good. Sorry, I went off on that. I know. I no, gotta say, this, I, is, this is like our jujitsu. It's like we like some people beat the crap out of like punching bags. Marianne and I just come and poop on stuff. I know, and it, honestly, like I'm so happy we started this podcast because I'm genuinely getting tired of saying the same thing on social media because I've it doesn't especially when it hits, when, when you hit a large population, when you're talking about mm -hmm. a topic like this, it's typically hitting the people that are going to challenge you or don't want to hear it. Yeah. And that gets, it gets really exhausting because the people that you're really tr like care about hearing this and maybe helping them make a change or save some money or avoid wasting their time typically don't hear it on mm -hmm. like a TikTok or an Instagram. Yeah. It's like, that's why we get so fired up about this stuff is because it's absolutely mind blowing. But criminal. How in this a lot of continues. Cases. Yeah. And how it's not ever going to go away. Like it's never going to mm. go away. We'll never, I, I'll never stop talking about it. I know I won't, but the capacity that I have to do that in a short and shortened form is for certain topics. It's just, I don't. I yeah. can only tell you greens powders don't do anything so often. Tony can only say that there's no point. That's also the point, though. You never change anyone's mind 
in a short form like that. It takes time. It takes explanations. Yeah. Like in the podcast, even if someone fundamentally disagrees with any of these, I guarantee you at least listening through a 20 minute piece on something is going to give them a new perspective where if someone's just saying something in 60 seconds or less, that mm -hmm. you have to leave out important details sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. what the person who fundamentally disagrees with it, that's what they pick on. Mm -hmm. So it's, it makes sense, right? It's hard to change someone's mind over social media, but that is, yeah. I am pumped. That's why podcast, this is one of my favorite things I've ever done. I know it is nice to be able to, like when we post clips too, I mean, granted some people don't want to know, but it's nice to have that option to be like, mm -hmm. yes, this is a short and 30 second clip. We touch on it in detail. We include all, we answer all these questions you have, concerns. This is a clip from a podcast. And it's nice to be able to still direct people, especially because we know that the people who are going to take the extra step to go and listen, like we want you guys here. We want the people who are skeptical, but also want to learn. Like that's, yeah. there's going to be people who don't care. And, but I feel like well, it's to learn nice and to challenge too. I don't know about you, but I've learned so much just through this podcast too. It's like you learn yeah. so much, challenge your previous, previously held beliefs. Yeah. It's fun. And it shouldn't sure. be a bad thing if you have a wrong opinion about something. It shouldn't yeah. be a wrong thing, but I think some people take it as. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, if you're right about everything, then one sign that you're not right about everything. That wraps up part one. We're going to be back with you next week with part two, going through five, four, three, two, and one. I'm actually a little bit worried because if this is how uh, today got a little hotter, spicier than I thought it would. I'm like, next week we might be in for some trouble with the top five because these ones are some of the I mean these ones grind both of our gears a little bit more these these ah, hit us in the mm, right spot yeah we're gonna take a little L theme out of him calm down before we, we do the next one so we don't freak out no I'm not <laughs> oh, I'm kidding, I won't no. be unhinged but... no, we'll just do we'll get Shane over here Shane Hammer get him do a little breath <laughs> do some breath work calm ourselves down <laughs> and get rolling but let us know what y'all think about top five. Shoot us a DM. Let us know what you think. And let's see if you can predict what's in next week, too. DM us. See what you, see what you think. See what you think. We'll see y'all back <laughs> next week. Any goodbyes? No. I never have a goodbye. Just I know. Like, still waiting bye. on that. Every week. 71 weeks in a row now, and I'm still like, nope, we're still around. <laughs>